Well, we have uh, Dr. Ice with us. He's got another great message uh, for us and a couple things. Again, he's a professor at Liberty University and uh, teaches theology there and, and uh, has authored a number of great, great books. And uh, you're, you, you benefit from that from me as we're going through Daniel and Revelation. And those PowerPoint slides that I'm showing you and those graphics are coming right from uh, uh, one of uh, Dr. Ice's uh, books. And uh, uh, it's just a great blessing to have with them. Just a little side uh, caveat, they have uh, uh, three boys, one of whom is a chaplain with 101st Airborne serving in Afghanistan right now. So his name is Tim, so if you want to keep him <laughs> in your prayers, uh, I know that there's a, a mom and dad here that would really appreciate that as well. Well, why don't you welcome uh, Dr. Thomas Ice. Well, it's good to be here in Hawaii with you. Uh, as I told the other people, uh, 39 years ago when my wife and I got married, <clears throat> we, uh, she wanted to come to Hawaii, uh, but uh, we went to Israel for our honeymoon instead. But now we're here in Hawaii. So why don't you stand up, Janice? She's all decorated in Hawaii <laughs> stuff. I know I'm mispronouncing Hawaii, but, uh, you know, nevertheless. And uh, here to this morning, we're going to talk about Israel and uh, God's plan in the future for Israel. How many of you knew there's a whole chapter in Revelation that deals with Israel? There is, and there's more in Revelation that deals with Israel. It's just that uh, many people have uh, misapplied it over the years to the church. But we see, uh, I call it the new anti-Semitism that is developing and uh, I always like to define it first. The old anti-Semitism is, is the hatred or persecution of the Jew. In other words, uh, just because they're Jews. The uh, new anti-Semitism, or the Oxford English Dictionary says that it's the anti-Semitism is the theory, action, or practice directed against the Jews, hence anti-Semite, one who is hostile or opposed to the Jews. You know, some people like to say, well, Semite, that refers to the Arabs as well, yes, but the meaning of words are determined by usage, not by etymology or where they come from. And so anti-Semitism refers to hatred of the Jews, not hatred of the Arabs. But uh, the new anti-Semitism, though rooted in past anti-Semitism, targets not just the Jew as an individual, but Israel as a nation. So the new Anti-Semitism is directed toward anti-Zionism and is anti-Israel because before the nation was founded in 1948, uh, they uh, were just uh, dealt with as individuals and now with the rise of Israel as a nation, you had after the Six-Day War and the Yom Kippur War, a book come out uh, called The New Anti-Semitism by Foster and Epstein that talked about how people were beginning to hate Israel, the nation, the collective, in the same way that they hate the individual in the past that led to the Holocaust. And we saw this when Israel was dealing with the, the Gaza situation. They had sent 12,000 missiles from Gaza into Israel. So Israel finally retaliated to go clean out you know, the weapons and everything in the Gaza war a few years ago. And it led to global protests all around the world. Uh, if Israel attacks Iran and takes out their nuclear, you know, uh, ability, we'll see even more protests and even uh, stronger ones. But here's an article out of the Jerusalem Post that talked about how widespread, this is the emphasis I want, want you to see, how widespread this has become. And it says the Interparliamentary Coalition for Combating Anti-Semitism is meeting today in London in the wake of the Gaza campaign, which ignited an exponential eruption of global anti-Semitic frenzy unprecedented since the Nazi era. The intensity of the anti-Jewish rage, frequently accompanied by acts of violence, has engendered fear and anxious anxiety among diaspora Jews and obligated many to seriously ponder their long-term future. On every continent and virtually in every city, enraged demonstrators have railed against Israel and indulged in anti-Semitic calls to boycott Jews, gas them, and dismantle the Nazi Israeli state. I remember in Orlando, Florida, seeing a clip of a lady in her Arab gear 
uh, telling the Jews to go back, back into the ovens. Uh, the anti-Jewish offensives usually indicated by Arab, uh, uh, initiated by Arabs have been supported by wide spectrums of indigenous citizens. Uh, Jew baiting is especially intense in the UK. Prominent Jews encounter death threats. Students at Oxford University have gleefully proclaimed that in five years their campus will be a Jew-free zone. A high-ranking British diplomat was arrested after publicly launching a foul-mouthed anti-Semitic tirade. The London-based Royal Court Theater is staging a viciously anti-Israel play by Carol Churchill that Melanie Phillips described in The Spectre as reminiscent of anti-Semitic plays performed in the Middle Ages, portraying Jews as demonic Christ killers. In many European cities, Jews encounter violence in the streets. In Italy, a labor union has called for a boycott of all Jewish businesses. In France, synagogues have been attacked and cars belonging to Jews firebombed. A Swedish school has refused to accept Jewish students. A leading Norwegian TV entertainer was sufficiently insensitive uh, to jokingly express regret for the billions of innocent lice killed with Jews in the gas chambers. The Barcelona municipality canceled a Holocaust memorial because making, quote, making a Jewish Holocaust ceremony while a Palestinian Holocaust was taking place was not right. Simultaneously, 30,000 Barcelonians marched in support of Hamas. Elsewhere, the deputy South African foreign minister was obliged to apologize after making a statement railing against Jewish money that controlled America, you know, the global Jewish conspiracy. In Turkey, in the wake of the prime minister's historic outbursts against Israel, Jewish institutions were vandalized and calls were made to boycott Jewish businesses. There were violent anti-Jewish riots at York University in Toronto. Canada. Even in the United States, where public opinion remains overly supportive of Israel, the blatantly anti-Semitic demonstrations in major cities have shocked many American Jews, hitherto confident that unlike in Europe, anti-Semitism would never reassert itself in their country. The increasing dominance of anti-Israel elements on most campuses provide additional grounds for concern because ultimately many of these youngsters will become leaders of the nation. And so we see this slice of how widespread this is becoming, and it's uh, risen up in the last few years because up until the last decade or so, uh, the memory of the Holocaust had kept a lot of this bottled up. And so we see that Adolf Hitler said that, gradually I began to hate them. For me, this was a time of the greatest spiritual upheaval I have ever gone through. I have ceased to be a weak-kneed cosmopolitan and have become an anti-Semite. And for him, it was a process, and it seems this process is building again, especially in the Arab world. And then, as the Muslims immigrate into Europe, uh, the medieval Catholic anti-Semitism that is part of their heritage combined with Islam is uh, causing it to come to the surface again. But you ain't seen nothing yet because Satan has a hatred for Israel. And because Satan cannot defeat God or directly, he's kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movies. Uh, nobody could beat Arnold, so they had one movie, they went after his wife and kids. And so in essence, Satan attacks God's people in this case, Israel, but also the church as well, as we know. But this chapter focuses on Israel, God's chosen people. And so we see that in the tribulation, the Antichrist is anti-Semitic. And as a result, he's anti-Israel. So this is what we're seeing, people talking about the nation of Israel in an anti-Semitic way that they used to talk about Jews as an individual. And the Bible says that anti-Semitism is caused by Satan himself. And we see this in Revelation chapter 12. All racism is bad, but this is in a special class of its own because it's a direct assault on God and his chosen people. Now, when we look at the book of Revelation, we need to realize that the book of Revelation is 
said twice to be a vision that John sees and he writes down what he sees. And he gives a verbal explanation of the visions that he sees, which contains symbols and things like that uh, about what's going to happen in the future. And so John, I think, was so, you know, in his 80s or 90s perhaps, was so filled with, with the Old Testament that when he, write, when he wrote, he used words and phrases from the Old Testament. And as a result, uh, there are at least 550 uh, allusions to the Old Testament. Never is the Old Testament quoted directly, in other words, as the scripture says, and then it quotes the Old Testament. But instead, almost every word and phrase in the book of Revelation is an allusion back to uh, the Old Testament itself. And Arnold Fruchtenbaum in his uh, book, Footprints of the Messiah, gives you a list of the 550 um, ones, and we're not saying it's limited to that, but it's at least that. And so I think the effect is, is since Revelation is the capstone of the Bible, this means that the book of Revelation is the grand central station of the Bible. It brings everything together, especially things that have yet been to be fulfilled. And so instead of dropping a tab of LSD and hallucinating on what all of these crazy symbols refer to, instead you need to know the whole Bible to be able to properly see what the book of Revelation is saying. It's the capstone of Scripture. And so also, we see that the book of Revelation is a, uh, so what John does by giving us this chronology is he plugs in many of the Old Testament passages into a sequence that therefore uh, gives us a framework for placing many of these Old Testament prophecies that are randomly stated in a sense throughout the Old Testament into a future sequence that can expand upon the, you know, the particular passages that we study in the book of Revelation. And so when we come to Revelation chapter 12, this is one of the places where the chronology pauses for him to introduce you, for example, in chapters 10 through uh, 15 to the eight of the seven key players in chapters 12 and 13 that you need to know about for the second half of the tribulation. And so he deals periodically with things in a topical way. And uh, chapter 12 is one of those topical issues that he deals with. And what you have here is the, a prophecy about the outworking of the struggle of Genesis 3.15, the seed of the serpent clashing with the seed of the woman. And we see the veil moved back and the angelic conflict is explained for us within this context for the book of Revelation so that we can understand when you get to the next chapter, for example, chapter 13, the beast, the human antichrist, who, is mo who uh, the dragon gives his power to for three and a half years. And so this get provides a context and a rationale for why it is that he attacks in the second half of the tribulation the nation of Israel and tries to wipe them out. And so uh, it says a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, people say the book of Revelation is the most symbolic book in the Bible. And they say chapter 12 is the most symbolic book in Revelation. And they say literal interpreters cannot interpret this because we're just a bunch of wooden literalists. Well, if you look up the meaning of the word literal, once again in the Oxford English Dictionary, the mother of all dictionaries, it says literal means according to the letter. In other words, a literal interpretation is to take what is written on the page of anything, whether it's the Bible or whatever, and to interpret what the text says. And it goes on in the Oxford English Dictionary and says, as opposed to allegorical interpretation, where you bring an idea or a concept from outside the text and you bring, impose that onto the text. That is allegorical or non-literal or literary interpretation. And so we see this often where people bring in the church and they plug it into Israel. The text says Israel. 
but they'll think church. That, my friend, is allegorical interpretation. It can be done in other ways as well. So to interpret literally means to interpret based on what the text says. This is not wooden literalism that doesn't allow for figures of speech and symbols. Literal interpretation allows for symbols and figures of speech as we will show you. In fact, there are 40, uh, 44 symbols in the book of Revelation, half of which are explained for you by the book of Revelation itself. For example, in chapter 1 it says that he's holding, a, uh, the, Jesus is holding in his right hand seven stars. Okay, and then it says the seven stars are seven angels. The Okay, and then he talks about the seven lampstands. It says the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So he's identifying the half of the time the symbols in the book itself so that you can understand what they mean. The rest of the symbols are defined for us somewhere else in Scripture, as we see here. For example, the sun and the moon and and uh, stars are defined elsewhere. But normally, if you look at most co uh, commentaries of Revelation down through church history, the woman is said to be, does anybody know? The church in most commentaries, or the Catholic church, or Mary. If you go to Europe to a cathedral, Mary's there with a crown with these 12 stars around it. By the way, that's where the European Union says they got the 12 stars for their flag. I've never seen them explain why they got the 12 stars, just that they selected those 12 stars for their flag. They seem to be attracted to satanic symbols in the European Union, you know, like a building their a parliament building in Strasbourg, France, in the form of an unfinished Tower of Babel. You know, or, you, you know, on one of their coins, they have the woman riding the beast. They seem to be attracted to these kinds of symbols for some odd reason. I'm not sure. But when you go to the Old Testament, this phrase, this collective phrase of sun, moon, and stars is used one other place in the Bible, and we see it in Genesis chapter 37. And uh, we see that Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had, for behold... We were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheath rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around you, around and bowed down to my sheath. Now, how, now what kind of brother would want to hear that from his other brother? Especially the punk younger brother, the youngest brother. Well, actually, Benjamin was, but he was the second youngest brother. Uh, then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule over us? Well, it could happen, as the angels in the outfield guy said. No, it happened. So they hated him even more for his dreams or for his words. Now, interestingly, in the book of Genesis, there are 12 visions that employ symbols and figures of speech. But the great thing about them is that every one of these Dreams that employ vi uh, the, or visions that have symbols in them are fulfilled in the lifetime of the person having the dream. For example, this is about Joseph and the, his future with his 12 brothers. And it, this vision was fulfilled in their lifetimes. So what we have here is the Bible shows us in the first book of the Bible how to handle symbolic or visionary language. It shows us that these symbols represent something that's going to happen in history. So they have a historical antecedents. And the key is understanding what those symbols mean. You know, that's what Daniel was able to do uh, for King Nebuchadnezzar. He, he, uh, God revealed to him what these symbols indicate. Joseph did it for Pharaoh. Now, we, we've got people out there, you know, with their PhDs from Harvard and places like that, who, who say that this... In fact, Hank Hanegraaff has picked up on this from them, and he says this is fantasy genre. In other words, they're saying that this is just a genre that is, is indicating the struggle between good and evil 
and that this does not reflect events that are going to or have happened in history. Uh, wrong. We see in, in Genesis 12, every one of these visionary dreams occurred in history. And we go on to the next verse and we see the symbol from Revelation 12, or that is used again in Revelation 12, where verse 9, he says, Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. Whoopee, I'm sure they went. And behold, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. So here you have these symbols grouped together just like like you do in Revelation 12. And he related it to his father. Who's his father? Jacob. And uh, to his brothers. They would be represented by the 11 stars plus Joseph of 12 stars. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I, Jacob, and your mother, Rachel, or perhaps Leah, and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? Yes, it, it happened in the book of Genesis. And so here we see that the Bible defines that grouping of sun, moon, and stars as a reference to Israel, not to the church. The Bible teaches that it is Israel that gave birth to the Messiah, as we see pictured here in this context as well, and that the church was born out of the side of, of Messiah, Jesus, and so, therefore, this cannot be the church that is in tribulation or that is giving birth to the, to the Messiah. But instead, it is the outworking of the seed of the serpent struggle with the seed of the woman as Israel gives birth through Mary to the Messiah. And she was with child. And uh, she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. Probably this is a reference, of course, historically that referred to Mary and the birth of the Messiah. But it probably is setting this within the context of the tribulation that is viewed as the time of birth pains. As we saw at the conference yesterday from Isaiah and Jeremiah. Then you have in verse 3, another sign appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. Now, I've already told you that some people say this dragon is an unrealistic thing that we would never run into in real life, so therefore it's a fantasy, fantasy genre and all of that. But if you read the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel defines uh, what this refers to in Daniel chapter 7. And, and this very same uh, form is clearly setting this phase of the conflict between the seed of the woman, seed of the serpent, in the context of the tribulation period, which is where Daniel sets, the 70th week of Daniel sets uh, this, the seven heads, ten horn, and uh, heads on the seven diadems, uh, entity or beast in the book of Daniel. So here it's associated with the red dragon, and which we're going to see in later verse that the dragon refers to Satan. And then it says the same thing again in Revelation 19. And, and so this is Satan, but he's in the context of the tribulation with seven heads. That refers to the seven heads or kingdoms uh, that are going to first, uh, through agreement, agree to come together to revive the Roman Empire. And out of one of those seven heads, the beast will arise, the man of lawlessness, the book of Daniel indicates, and then he will militarily take over three more kingdoms to create a ten nation or ten horn kingdom that will then make a agreement with the Antichrist. And the seven diadems throughout Daniel used two or three other times and later in Revelation 17 as well refers to well, in Revelation 17, it's called the seven hills on which the woman rides the beast. That is not Rome. You know, um, I'm very, very, very good friends with Dave Hunt, and he wrote a great book called The Woman Rides the Beast. It's a very good book about Roman Catholicism. But I disagree with the idea that uh, Rome on seven hills is Roman, you know, that the, the woman riding the beast is Roman Catholicism. 
Instead, the seven hills are seven mountains which represent kingdoms throughout the book of Daniel. And so the seven kingdoms refer to the seven empires that have uh, persecuted Israel. And the first is Egypt. The second is uh, Assyria that took the northern kingdom in 721, 722 into captivity. And the book of Daniel picks up with the third one, which is Babylon. And that's why in chapter 2, Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar, you, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. See, showing that these symbols have historical antecedents as well. Then the fourth one is the Medo-Persian team, uh, kingdom which conquered the Babylonians. Then the Greek kingdom... Alexander the Great that conquered the Medo-Persian Empire and then split into four which produced Antiochus Epiphanes that persecuted the Jews in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 11, 1 through 35. And then you see the, f the last sixth king, which is the fourth, and as a, an indescript beast. In other words, it's so fierce that they cannot associate it with the actual beast of the field. So it's simply called the beast, which is Rome that conquered the whole world. No one in these visions in chapter two or seven conquered Rome and so it just dissipated and it's going to be revived in the last days. And so the last 2,000 years of European history have been the attempts of people to bring the Roman Empire back together. In fact, about, uh, well, uh, next month it'll be two years ago I had a debate at Oxford University on the end is nigh. So they had to bring a crazy American over, uh, you know, to represent the wacko view that the end is near. And I used three arguments in that debate to show that we're near the time of Christ's return. Number one, Israel's back in the land. I call that the super sign of the super sign. Nobody can argue with that. And I briefly showed how the Bible predicted that would be the case. Secondly, I, I talked about globalism and how uh, during the tribulation we'll have a global government and, and no one would question that we're moving toward globalism. And this was right after the election of Barack Obama. And I said, see, even America, which was the only nation up to this point acting on national interest in the war on terrorism, now was m becoming a global part of the global citizen of the world, as Obama has said that he... Uh, would like to do. And then the third one I used was the revived Roman Empire, that it is being revived through the European Union. That's not a fulfillment, but it is a, a means. And a girl asked me during the question and answer time, she says, what about the Spanish Empire and the, the uh, British Empire and all these other empires? And I quoted them a nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. The last 2,000 years of European history have been efforts to revive the Roman Empire, and they've all failed. That's what the Spanish and French and British empires have been. And I said, what they failed to do is be, the re empire is being revived through trade, through economics. That's exactly what Revelation 17 and 18 indicate. That will be an empire built on trade and economics. And so those were the three things that I argued is why we are near uh, the return of the Lord. But we see here those seven diadems and then his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And this is once again a symbol of uh, when, when stars are used literally in the book of Revelation, it refers to stars or asteroids that, you know, are real entities out there. But when it's used symbolically or connotatively, then it refers to angels always. And so here he's talking about, uh, in the, as a figure of speech, as we'll see him interpreting it later in this chapter, angels that are, were cast down. So he's referring to the one-third of the angels that fell in the original fall, but in the future, they are going to be kicked out of heaven because we know from the book of Job that they're part of the angelic council. They still have access to God. 
uh, as, the, as he calls them together occasionally, and we're going to see in a moment that they do other things up there as well. And he goes on and says, And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And so here you see the posturing or the relationship of the dragon to the woman is one of conflict. The conflict between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And Satan is out to destroy the woman, Israel, who is about to give birth to the man-child. Of course, that's a past event. And so she, Satan wants to devour her child. So we're starting to see why Israel is going to be the center of uh, the focus during the tribulation. And we're already seeing that even in our own days because Israel is God's chosen people. And if Satan can interrupt the plan of God by destroying the Jewish people, then he believes he will ha overcome and conquer God and show that his original complaint against God in the book of Job, that God's not a good God, God doesn't know what he's doing, will have been vindicated, and he will uh, believes he will dethrone God if such a thing occurs. Now, of course, it's not going to occur. It's certain because God is able to handle all of these details uh, through Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, this is the meaning of history and the struggle that's going on as he pulls the veil back and shows us the angelic aspect of what's going on in history. Now, here are other historical instances of Satan's hostility toward the woman's seed. We have in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, where Eve said, Behold, I have begotten a man-child, and the King James has in italics, with the help of, and then it says, the Lord. And I think that's a misfortune that the King James put with the help of because what you have in the Hebrew is she says, Behold, I have begotten a man-child. And if you were diagramming this, you'd put equal marks because it, what follows is an appositional statement. In other words, the Lord. She thinks that right off God is fulfilling the Genesis 3, 15 mandate of the seed of the woman that Cain is going to be the Messiah or the Deliverer. Boy, was she wrong. And, and mothers have been disappointed in their sons ever since. And that's why Cain's murder of Abel is part of this struggle. Instead of being the deliverer, he seems to be on Satan's side, as the New Testament says. Then you have the corrupting of the human seed through angelic and human marriages in Genesis 6, 1 through 12. I think those Baniha Elohim in the Hebrew does refer to angels. Yes, fallen angels who intermarried with women and produced their offspring called the Nephilim, which were part human, part angelic, apparently. Angels can take on the form of, of a human being. I guess today if they sh showed up, they would have a white suit or maybe a white Hawaii uh, shirt on or whatever. But they uh, could have corrupted the seed of humanity back to Adam and made man unsavable. So that's why God sends the flood to destroy them and then prevents them from doing this throughout human history so that our federal head Adam, uh, we, we all have his DNA, enables us to then be saved by the second Adam, Jesus Christ, who dies in our place. Then you have the attempt rapes of Sarah in Genesis 12, Rebecca in Genesis 26, Re Rebecca's plan to cheat Esau out of his birthright and the consequent enmity between Esau and Jacob, Genesis 27, the murder of the male children in Egypt that Moses was delivered from and be eventually became the savior, the human savior of the nation as he led them out of Egypt. You have the tempted murders of David in, in 1 Samuel 18. You have Queen Athaliah's attempt to destroy the royal seed in 2 Chronicles 22.10 where a little boy, Joash, was hid away in the temple, seven, eight, nine years old. And if he had been killed, then the royal seed would have been cut off and God would not have been able to fulfill his promise as predicted. But guess what? He was saved. And that continued. And then you have Haman's attempt to slaughter the Jews in the book of Esther, well-known case of corporate anti-Semitism there. Then consistent attempts of the Israelites 
Israelites to murder their own children for false sacrificial purposes throughout the Old Testament, then Herod's attack against the children of Bethlehem and the slaughter of the innocent that Matthew 2 talks about as he tries to wipe out Jesus, then many incidents during Jesus' earthly life, including his temptation that typify the ongoing attempt of the dragon to devour the woman's child once born. So there's a lot going on in history that if the Bible didn't tell us about, we wouldn't know about. And that's part of the purpose of God's revelation is to tell us these things. And so Satan's purpose in the tribulation, it's his last chance and his only hope is to destroy the Jews. Why? Because the second coming requires Israel to be converted to Jesus the Messiah and once converted to call on the Messiah to come and rescue them. The second coming is a rescue event. It's not just Jesus saying, oh, it's time for me to go on stage now, and here he comes. It's a, a rescue of Israel. And so, guess what? Israel is going to be converted. And the, the Bible is showing us all these details that are going to happen. And verse 5 says, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Uh, that is a reference to Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And so here the Greek word harpazo is used. Harpazo is the word that's translated rapture in 1 Thessalonians uh, 4. And so you have the later part of the Bible looking back at an earlier part of the New Testament, Acts 1, where Christ ascends, and it calls or describes that ascension as a rapture. And that's how God gets people from planet Earth to heaven. And the woman fled into the wilderness, Israel, where she had a place prepared by God so that she might be nourished for 1,260 days. Now, this term nourished is a term right out of the uh, book of Exodus that refers to the Jews and God's supernatural provision for 40 years as they wandered in the wilderness. And he provided manna and water and all of these other things. So this is why. Why some people call this the second exodus, because it's going to be, as we'll see, in the middle of the tribulation, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 15, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So they're going to be there, probably Petra, for three and a half years, and God's apparently going to provide manna and water and other provisions to protect the Jewish people during this time. And uh, I believe Revelation 11 at the end where the two witnesses are, are killed, their bodies lie in the street for three and a half days, then they're resurrected and caught up. And it says, and some feared, and I think that refers to the Jewish people who become converts by the middle of the tribulation through the ministry of the two witnesses. And they're witnessing to the Jewish people and evangelizing them during the first three and a half years. Otherwise, why would unbelieving Jews listen to Jesus when he tells them in Matthew 24, 15, when you see this abomination of desolation and because the two witnesses are there to protect the Temple Mount, perhaps even oversee the rebuilding of the temple, then the two witnesses who have the ability to call down fire from heaven, prevent the Antichrist from going into the temple and setting up his image. And so God removes them, converts many Jews in Israel and Jerusalem so they'll flee when they see this, and then it's that point that the Antichrist goes in and sets up his image. And here you have Jesus saying, "For then there will be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now nor ever shall be. Quote right out of Daniel 12. And unless those days have been cut short, no life would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Now, the term elect is used three times in Matthew 24. I think all three times it refers to Jewish believers because this is a quote right out of Daniel. And in Daniel it says, everyone whose name has been written in the book of life will be rescued. And so Jesus shortens this circumlocution, everyone whose name is found written in the book, to the elect you see, and describes that. And so when you, you look at Daniel and Matthew, they, they come together and the Jewish believers are going to flee. 
the, at the midpoint of the tribulation. And we see in Isaiah 41 him describing this. The afflicted and needy are seeking water, but there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them myself. Uh, as the God of Israel, I will not forsaken them. I will open rivers on the bare heights. In other words, he's talking about he will supernaturally intervene in the desert for Israel where there is not water. And the fact that he will bring water for his people results in, in the growth of, uh, he says, uh, and the dry land fountains of water. And I'll put cedar in the wilderness, Achaia, myrtle, and olive tree, and juniper in the desert together with the box tree and the cypress. In other words, it's going to prosper. It's going to start looking more like Hawaii than uh, the wilderness. That they may see and recognize and consider and gain insight as well that the hand of the Lord has done that. That's an idiom for God's direct intervention as opposed to using uh, intermer in intermediate means. And the Holy One of Israel has created it. And we see in Micah, to 12. Did I, did I tell y'all I have a grandson named Micah? And he's two. And uh, we bought him a ukulele uh, because his dad plays guitar. And so I'm sure in another year or two, he'll probably be up there with the worship team <laughs> strumming away. Uh, but nevertheless, back to the Micah of the Bible, whom he was named after, nevertheless. I, he, and here he says, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I, I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. So this is who, who it's going to be. Those, the one-third of the Jewish nation that's going to be saved through the tribulation. Other passages teach us, Ezekiel 20, Ezekiel 22, uh, Daniel chapter 12, uh, that the non-elect... Jewish people will be purged out during the tribulation. See, in the 40-year wandering, God purged out that generation, remember, for unbelief. This time he's going to purge out the, the rebel, as Ezekiel 22 says, the unbeliever before the time to make a decision comes. And so that's why Paul is able to talk about a mystery, a new revelation, that all Israel will be saved in Romans 11. At the, by the end of the tribulation, every Jewish person on, on the planet will have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. And so the Jews will go into the millennium, fulfill their destiny. That's why you have the 144,000 in the first half of the tribulation. They're going to be, fulfill their calling to be a light to the nations. They're going to evangelize the world in the first half of the tribulation. And then... Every Jewish person in their mortal body who goes in the millennium will be a believer. There won't be a single unbeliever in the millennium as God makes it up to the Jewish people for all the lean years, so to speak. And I will put them together like sheep in the fold. The Hebrew word for sheepfold is Basra. And it's near Basra in Jordan today that uh, this is a prophecy six or seven hundred years before the time of Christ that around the time of Christ, the Edomians came and built what is, we know as Petra, which is near a Basra. So Basra is a reference to what today is Petra in the Old Testament. Uh, like a flock in the midst of its pasture, they will be noisy with men. By the way, put down Isaiah 63, 1 through 3, where it talks about, I'm, I, I don't have time to get into that, where Christ will first come to Basra, to, with blood on his garments and rescue the Jewish people before he comes and ascends in Revelation 19 to rescue the rest of the folk. And so, meanwhile, back in heaven, there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer found a place for them in heaven. I don't know why God waits till three and a half years in the tribulation to kick those dudes out, but it's probably because he's demonstrating things in history. You know, don't you wish God speed it up, you know, come on. We're like the sons of thunder, uh, strike those people dead. You know, or even in the early part of the tribulation where the martyrs that come out that were saved during the tribulation and then killed, and they say in Revelation 7, How long, O Lord, holy and just, will thou not avenge our blood of those who dwell on the earth, the earth dweller there? And they're saying, in other words, wrap this thing up. Instead, God takes seven years. He's very methodical. He goes things by the books. It's because he's demonstrating things in history, you see. 
he's showing to Satan and the angelic realm and as a legacy for all of history who and what he is, how patient he is, for example. And so, nevertheless, they have access in the angelic council till the midpoint. The dragon and his angels waged war and they were not strong enough and there was no longer found a place for them in heaven. So he starts fulfilling uh, the job of taking back planet earth, the title deed that you see in Revelation 5 that the Lamb takes by cleaning up heaven and getting rid of those guys and kicking them out. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan. So here's where he's identified. See, no LSD for me. Met the man from Galilee, Larry Norman. But uh, nevertheless, you don't have to uh, speculate on this. It tells you who it refers to. Who deceives the whole world. See, all unbelievers are under his deception. That's what 2 Thessalonians 2. God is going to send them a strong delusion through false signs and wonders. He's going to bring the Antichrist back to life. And uh, nevertheless, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So that's a repeat of the tail sweeping the third of the stars, and here they're called angels. So it identifies who they are. They're cast down to the earth. I mean, the second half of tribulation is going to be a bad, mean place to be uh, with Satan himself probably indwelling the Antichrist, not just a demon, and all these demons running around. It's going to be a bad place. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, his Messiah, have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before God day and night. That's what he's been doing. Satan's up there accusing believers, Jewish people in this instance, but we know in 1 John 2, the same thing for us and Christ intervenes on our behalf. He is the defense attorney who comes and says, this person is washed in the blood and they, uh, you're, you're filing a frivolous uh, wrong lawsuit. And so Satan's like that, that sleazy lawyer guy who's always going around filing these bad lawsuits and he finally loses his standing he's disbarred and he's kicked out of heaven and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb in other words the atonement of Christ is the basis of our salvation and because of the word of their testimony the fact that we personally trust in it you have to personally trust in Christ's death on the cross to pay for your sin for it to be applied to you and it results then in living a changed life and they did not love their life even to death they become followers of the Lamb. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, the heaven dwellers, versus the earth dwellers, and you who dwell in them, and woe to the earth and the sea. Now, in Texas, where I'm originally from, that's how you stop your horse. Whoa, Nelly. But this word comes from the Old Testament, and it means a judgment oracle. A oracle is a statement or declaration of judgment. And that's what woe means. It's a oracle of judgment to the earth and the sea because the devil has come down to you having great wrath knowing that he only has a short time. And so this is the way evil is. If you only have a short time, they don't kick back and say, hey, I'm going to be Hawaiian and hang loose. Instead, they're, they get real tense and engaged and it's like this guy who's been on a crime spree and he ch the police chasing him. He finally get him in a home or, and, they, and the police are out there. Come out, you're surrounded. Come out with your hands up. Do they just go, okay, you guys win. Here I come. No, they want to take down as many people with them as they can. Innocent people, policemen, whatever. Because that's the nature of evil. Satan is going to be energized like he never has before because he only has a short time. Now, if Satan's energized with knowing he has a short time, how should believers be? You see, we should be even quadruply uh, energized knowing that he only has a short time. So we see here in verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. This is why Israel is persecuted. It's supernatural. 
Many people can't tell you today why they hate the Jews. They just know they do. And it seems to fit in with what everybody else, whoops, almost knocked your microphone down. Uh, sometimes even I get animated. But <laughs> nevertheless, um, I heard Chuck Smith last year talking about how his wife said that you know, early in his ministry he needed to be more animated in his preaching. And so he, he uh, decided that he would uh, uh, do that. And so he walked over, raised his hand to make a point, and he forgot what he was going to say. So he said that, I tried that once, and it didn't work. But nevertheless, back to the story here. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child because this explains the, why Israel is the focus of opposition to, uh, throughout the world by unbelievers, and they can't even articulate oftentimes why they hate it. And it's just getting started. It's going to reach its apex during the tribulation in the second half. And then we see verse 14 that says, And the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman in order that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. Now, how many of you all think this refers to the Israeli Air Force, two wings? The American Air Force? The Texas Air National Guard, led by George W. Bush? No, no takers on that. This is an idiom, a figure of speech, that once again associates this with the exodus. Because this is the, another place where God uses this language of t the wings of an eagle for his deliverance of the Jewish people during the Exodus. And he will deliver her, she'll fly into the wilderness where she was nourished, the second time, all the Exodus connotations, for a time, time and a half time, three and a half years, from the presence of the serpent. The book of Hosea said God's going to put Israel in seclusion and he's going to talk sweetly to her in private within the motif there of Hosea. Because Hosea also teaches that Israel is going to realize that no one else likes her. She, no, everybody hates her. And God's going to say, but I care for you. And she's going to realize that the, you know, the, that the God of Israel is the one who's going, going to uh, deliver her. And she's going to have no friends in the world in the tribulation. And here's Exodus 19.4. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Exodus 19.4. And then we see Deuteronomy 32.10-11. Deuteronomy 32.10-11 uses similar language of the Exodus. And here in verse 15, the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman. I think that's an idiom for uh, military pursuit so that he might cause her to be swept away with a flood. In other words, to destroy them. And the earth helped the woman. The earth, the land, Eretz. And the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of its mouth. Now, it could mean, I think, that as in the Exodus, they open, the earth opens and swallows people, perhaps the army that go out to look for them or it could just be an idiom which would match what is said in verse 15 uh, that simply the earth is able to hide or prevent them from finding them as they're hid away in Petra and uh, I don't know people say well can't Satan read in the Bible and all this yes he can but the point is God prevents them from being found and we can't find Bin Laden <laughs> yet and the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So he, this either refers to other Jewish believers throughout the world or it could include Gentile believers as well. And so he goes off and he's doubly mad or angry at uh, other believers during the tribulation. And so here we see chapter... Uh, 12 of Revelation is a pause to explain the struggle of the seed of the serpent, seed of the woman, and explain why Israel, the woman, is attacked during this time 
and we see the buildup in our own day. And so this means that we only have a short, short time, that we should be doubly active in living for Christ, proclaiming his word, learning his word, and that we should stand for Israel because that is the focus of God's kingdom when it comes that Israel literally is going to reign and rule over the nations during the millennium. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this portion of scripture that you've given us. Only the Bible has prophecy that comes true. And only in the Bible is the best yet to come in the future. In, in the world, they look back to past times as, as the good old days. But only Christians in the Bible can look forward to the good old days that are going to come, that are going to be better than anything we know of today. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know if they've trusted Christ as their Savior, that you would speak to their hearts like you're going to speak to Israel in the wilderness. And you would show them their need, their sin, and the provision that Christ has to offer. And that they would come and drink from the living waters that he provides. And Lord, be with us as believers that we might get our priorities straight by realizing where the future is headed so that we can act responsibly in light of that in the present. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.